Well, let me start out by pointing, making three observations about uh, reasons why I'm a little nervous about giving this talk. <laughs> First of all, most of you in this audience know more about politics than I do. Um, when I talk about the 1952 election, you guys actually voted in it, right? And so that's a huge advantage that I don't have. Um, I'm <laughs> uh, all teasing aside, the second reason is that I know full well that Mark Hetherington here, was here last week, and Mark is a hard, hard act to follow. The third reason is actually kind of a personal pleasure for me, is in the audience is my colleague and friend, Erwin Hargrove. Erwin and I have been colleagues for many, many years. I've never lectured in front of Erwin uh, before, and that's in fact a bit nerve-wracking because those of you who know Erwin was, is a, been a professor at Vanderbilt for a long period of time, but from my point of view, he's one of the leading scholars of the presidency of his generation and of subsequent generations, and so for that reason, it's a little nerve-wracking. But in any case, I'm here to have some fun, and I'm hope, hopefully you guys will as well. And what I want to try to do is one of the things I enjoy in my life is making fun of the news media. Um, the reason for that is not because the news media are polarized. You have Fox News and you have MSNBC, which are both somewhat ludicrous in their own uh, particular ideological ways, but they generally just get the story wrong. And so they don't pay enough attention to, frankly, what political scientists say, and as a result, they kind of tell stories they are a little bit off. So what I want to do today is actually tell you, tell you with a bunch of data about how to think about this upcoming presidential election. And the reason for that is that the general consensus is that Barack Obama is in big trouble, and that they have a lot of different indicators about why Barack Obama is in trouble, and I'm going to try to go through those. And that among the reasons he's in trouble, and we'll talk about the economy, because obviously that matters a lot, but among the reasons offered up is the Tea Party. That the Tea Party has energized the Republican Party, and that the Tea Party will be, in fact, Barack Obama's undoing at the final analysis. My argument is going to be that, in fact, the Tea Party is a gift from God to Barack Obama. Okay. So that's going to be the opening presentation, that, in fact, Barack Obama should be grateful for the Tea Party, and I will try to convince you why. Now, of course, it's kind of an opening comment. If, for some reason, the economy suddenly takes off, which is possible, probably not likely, of course, Barack Obama becomes in really good shape. If the economy goes down south, he's in pretty bad shape. So this talk is based on roughly an assumption that the economy is going to stay where it is now, kind of middling. But that will become part of our story. So as political scientists tend to do, let's start with some data. And the first data I want to present, and I assume I'm still coming clear to all quarters, OK, great, is in fact some public opinion data and the approval that Barack Obama has. These numbers change a little bit, but basically he's in the hole right now. And at the time of this reading, he was 19 points in the hole. I checked this morning, and depending on which measure, he's maybe 16 or 17 points in the hole. But basically, he's not very popular. And that doesn't come as a surprise to any of you. But the news media certainly tout this as a big reason for why he's in trouble, that he is unpopular and he is facing serious hurdles. OK, let's go to the next piece of data. Well, that wasn't good. Um, is this like a really slow computer and testing me? Or do we have, I'm wondering. <laughs> well, it goes back. Let's just take a look here. Oh, well, I know why. There's a blank page there. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, I always tease people that, you know, one of the beauties of tenure is that it's kind of a job that's guaranteed. And also the, the <laughs> academic life itself is, is a wonderful life because we get to, to read and to, to think and talk with, with really smart people. But I always figured if the state of nature was really where I was, I would not have made breakfast. Um, I would have been eaten very early in the state of nature, and this kind of thing is a demonstration of that. Okay, my second piece of data. Romney right now leads Barack Obama in most of the opinion polls. It's often very close, like this is. Sometimes it's two points, sometimes it's one point. But at this point in time, Romney has a narrow lead. He has a narrow lead. Again, further evidence that Barack Obama is in trouble, or at least the news media tout that as the case. So 
What's going on in talking about the news media? The news media are not very kind these days to Barack Obama. They refer to him as out of touch, rudderless. Uh, there was criticism about a month ago that it looked like the White House was being run by kind of an inside boys network, that the women in the White House were kind of on the outs in the power structure, and that he was catching a lot of flack for that. And, the, and, you know, and you know he likes to vacation in Martha's Vineyard, and so people are criticizing him about that. He spent time in Hawaii over the Christmas vacation. He's been criticized about that. Um, you know, in fact, if you listen to the Republican debates, of which there was one, I guess, uh, Monday night, you know, he doesn't even have a jobs plan, um, which I think he actually does. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, there's just all this kind of criticism that's going on. The news media are interpreting Barack Obama's move through a negative prism, so to speak. And that negative prism is reflected in the kind of data like popularity and like the Gallup troll, trial heats. If, in fact, Barack Obama was real wildly popular, if, in fact, he was leading Mitt Romney or any of his Republican competitors by a huge amount, there would be a very different kind of news media spin on this. But all of this is leading Barack Obama down a path of, uh, of defeat, as so the, or so the argument goes. So there are three reasons why it looks so grim for Obama. And I don't think any of these will come as a surprise to you. The first is the economy, because the economy is struggling and we have high unemployment. The second is the economy. <laughs> And you can now guess the third, the economy, okay? It is the economy. That is the problem. Imagine for a moment if unemployment was 4% and GDP growth was 5%, again, the news media would be interpreting Barack Obama's actions through a very different prism. And the same dynamic took place in the 1980s. And the you know, people don't remember this as well as they should, that in the early 1980s, Ronald Reagan was very unpopular. Ronald Reagan had faced high unemployment rates. There was a big deficit. There was a lot of unhappiness with his presidency. And he was being criticized roundly. But then when the economy started to turn around, all of a sudden there was much more positive reactions to it because the economy was doing well. So presidents, in some sense, get too much credit for success and far too much blame for failure at least in regards to the economy, and this shapes the whole, the whole conversation. Well, let's take a look at these economic indicators and see if, in fact, Barack Obama is as much problem as we think. First of all, unemployment's fallen a little bit. I guess in December, job growth was at 200,000, which is certainly some good news for the president. Unemployment hovers around 9%, though the actual measurement of unemployment in and of itself is a problem because a lot of people have given up looking for jobs, and so that number is probably slightly lower than it, than it should be. Um, I think it's, it's now below 9% a little bit, and that's, that's certainly good news. But again, except for Franklin Roosevelt in 1936, presidents do not get reelected with high rates of unemployment. And of course, he was reelected in 1936 because unemployment was so very high in 32 that it actually was coming down, even though it was in an absolute number pretty high. There continues among economists to be talk of double-dip recession. Um, I have learned, and we'll come back to this in a sense, that you know, political science know a lot about elections. And I always thought economists know a lot about the economy, but I'm no longer convinced of, of that. Um, all these predictions, you can find any economist to make a prediction. Things are going to go great or things are going to go terrible. But certainly there's a lot of discussion about the possibility of a double-dip recession. Certainly Americans, as pointed out by the third point, a lot of Americans think the economy is getting worse. Now, just last December, we saw an uptick in some of the, what's called the Michigan indicators that the public is beginning to think a little bit more positively about the economy, but still, the numbers are pretty low. And here in the state of Tennessee, uh, Vanderbilt does a poll now, um, twice a year at least, and again, most citizens of Tennessee, let alone in the country, think the economy is not doing very well. And again, that's another indicator. So whether you're looking at aggregate economic indicators that we rely on, like unemployment, or the public's perception, all of these things are bad news for the president. And here's why. This is just a simple graph of the relationship between the growth of personal income and the difference between the incumbent share of the vote and the challenger share of the vote. So basically, as, that, as this number, let's see if I can get the, I don't know if you can see. As this graph, let me just go over here to the center here. As this goes up, that means the incumbent does better, and obviously the economy is doing better. 
It turns out that the single best indicator predictor of the presidential vote is growth in personal income. So that's the single best. There's a lot of other ones you could measure. You could measure unemployment rate, for instance. Surprisingly, unemployment doesn't do much to predict presidential vote, which is somewhat surprising. Um, if you look at GDP, growth, gro gross domestic product, that does a reasonable job of predicting. But this one does the best, growth in personal income, which is some measure of how each of you, on average, are doing. And so as people are getting more and more income, the incumbent does better and better. Um, and you can see how this, how this graph, and there's a very strong relationship. And political scientists, as well as some economists, have hinged a lot on this particular kind of graph and these particular data. And as political scientists, just as a side note, we can predict with a real high degree of accuracy the outcome of presidential elections about six months prior to the actual casting of votes. So in June or so of the election year, that state of the economy, if we plug it in, so to speak, into, into this regression, we can predict. So that in 2008, Given the state of the economy, the prediction was that Barack Obama, the Democrat, would win 53% of the vote. This prediction was made in June of 2008. Barack Obama got 53% of the vote. Um, there have been a few cases that have been off prediction. Al Gore was predicted to win about 53 or 4% of the vote in 2000, and he only got 50%. 50% plus a little bit above that, remember. Um, <laughs> I say that as still a bitter Tennessean who was denied the chance, and Irwin and I talked about this years ago. There could have been a presidential library here at the Vanderbilt campus, but <laughs> the interest in a vice presidential library is just not all that great. Um, uh, I can remember actually having a conversation with Irwin about that, and he just kind of laughed and didn't say anything yes or no, but the laugh indicated the answer. Um, <laughs> I don't know of any vice presidential libraries. Um, so Gore didn't do very well based on the predictions, but it's also true that Gore didn't talk very much about the economy, that Gore didn't tout the successes of the economy. He, in fact, ran a very different kind of campaign that probably ended up costing him votes because he didn't remind the American public, that, yeah, Bill Clinton has his problems. Yeah, Monica Lewinsky's in the background. Yes, all that's true, but the economy was doing pretty well. And Gore chose not to do that for a variety of different reasons, and maybe he had to. But the bottom line is, is that these things do a pretty good job. There are a few examples of misprediction, but we know pretty well. So the economy matters a lot, and right now the economy is struggling. And if, in fact, you plug in today's economy into the regression equation, Barack Obama does lose based on that prediction. Obama will probably lose. But there's a couple of caveats that I'll add at the end of or during the course of the conversation. Okay, for those of you who are Obama fans, or at least not Republicans, let's not panic quite yet. Um, and here's three reasons to not panic. First of all, this is a really surprising fact to me, and I've double-checked it, that the condition of the economy today does not predict the condition of the economy in six months. That the correlation between the fourth quarter of the year before the election and the second quarter or the, I mean the third quarter of the presidential election, the correlation is 0.09. In other words, there's no relationship. The bottom line is that there isn't any tie between the two. And so that the economy, in fact, what this means is the economy could soar. It could do really well. Of course, the downside is the economy could end up doing worse. So those people, such as the news media and other people who have invested so much energy in saying, look, the economy's bad now, therefore Barack Obama will lose, don't have this little tidbit. That is, that there's not much gain to knowing what the economy is today. We need to know six months down the road. And if you think about it this way, those of you who follow the stock market, you know that any on a given day, it's kind of a random walk. It might go up 200 points one day. It might go down 100 points the next day. It's random. Well, it turns out that quarter, quarterly e the economy it has a random component, too, much more so than I would have anticipated. So here, as a follow-up, if you use the correlation of, a, of the economy a year out, it doesn't predict the presidential vote very well. It only has a 0.2 correlation, where it's 0.75 for the, for, the, for the election year. So if you go back, this correlation here is 0.75 approximately. But when you put in the year before, it has some predictive ability, but pretty limited. So that's a reason for caution. That's a reason for caution. Do not overinterpret the current conditions as an indication of what they're going to be, and therefore structuring what will happen to Barack Obama. And understand how the economy works. And let's just take a small sec second here to talk about that. We have this correlation 
up here. Now, I do not want to suggest to you that American voters say, oh, growth and income's up, GDP's up, I'm going to vote for the incumbent. <laughs> That's not how it works, okay? Most Americans don't necessarily know what the GDP is or the growth of income. But this graph works so well because it basically predicts the kind of election campaign you can run. And this argument's been made by a woman named Lynn Vavrick, who is at UCLA. And Lynn is a very talented political scientist. And her core argument is as follows. If the economy is doing well, you can run a positive, upbeat campaign touting the economy. And if the economy is doing badly, you can't do that. And therefore, what this predicts isn't that the voters are paying attention directly to the economy. It's predicting the kind of campaign you can run. So go back to 1984 and Ronald Reagan's re-election bid. He ran a very famous set of ads and a very famous campaign called Morning in America. And they were beautiful ads. You, taught, you know, there was one ad started out with a, 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 a tugboat in, the, in New York City Harbor. It was misty. And it was talking about people getting up in the morning around 7 a.m. and going to work. And then during the course of the day, buying new homes. There was a couple that was actually a young couple getting married while a, mo while a mother was watching her daughter get married and the kind of pride that she felt at this particular point in time. There was real growth in America, real happiness. There was mourning in America was the whole theme. It was beautiful campaign, beautiful visuals. And Ronald Reagan could run that campaign. But could Barack Obama run a Morning in America campaign right now, given the state of the economy? No. No, the Republicans' campaign is going to be, it's darkness in America, right? I mean, that's what they're going to run in 2012 if the economy is doing badly, which, you know, at this point in time, you have to figure it's muddling through. But if it, in fact, ends up doing better, you can run the Morning in America campaign. Go back to just eight years ago, George Bush. George Bush won re-election by about three points, but he could not run the morning in America. Why? Because we were still dealing with the aftermath of 9-11. We were still in the grips of that and still fearful of what was unfolding at that time. And also, the economy was not growing at that kind of rate. So instead, George Bush ran a very serious, you know, very famous set of ads attacking John Kerry. In fact, spent most of his time criticizing Kerry, trying to tout his, his uh, security credentials as president and going after. There was no optimism there. So the way the economy structures things is it affects the kind of campaign you can run. The thing that's fascinating, I think, and, and as you watch the campaign in 2012, this is the key question, is how does Barack Obama deal with the economy? Because he, I don't think it really works to say, well, things could have been worse. That's kind of what he's argued, right? And that really isn't going to resonate. And in fact, the Republicans can pounce on that pretty effectively. In fact, Mitt Romney has. They could have been worse. And you know, he just like, you know, you can't b believe that. But I think the bigger argument that he can make, he's got to find that, is to find a way to remind the public about what was going on in January of 2009. The previous quarter in 2008, the GDP had shrunk, I think, seven points. I mean, the economy was really in desperate, desperate shape. And so how do you judge today's economy? Can, in fact, Barack Obama, where this growth is kind of in between, he's right on the regression line at this point in time, that is that he could either win or lose, can he convince the public that things are a little bit better because where we came from? It's a slightly harder argument to make, but it'll be interesting to see how he tries to frame the debate. Now, of course, if the economy does do better, then he's given a gift and he can work, you know, work with that. But if not, that's the argument they've got to make. And it's not necessarily, as I said, a simple one or an easy one. So I want to stress that these gra this graph is just predicting and anticipating the kind of campaign that people can run. And if you think back to the Morning in America campaign by Reagan, if you go back four years earlier, when he was running against Jimmy Carter, he was attacking Carter really harshly. Why? Because the economy was struggling. He did not run a positive, optimistic campaign. It was a very harsh, negative campaign because there was a lot of complaints going on about Jimmy Carter. And so as a result, he capitalized on those. And Carter couldn't run an optimistic campaign. Basically, one of Carter's main campaign themes is reflected in his ads is, look, I'm at least safe on foreign policy. I'm not going to cause a war. And that Ronald Reagan might cause a war. That was kind of the argument that he was making. It's not really an optimistic, upbeat one, but the data didn't allow it. So again, that's the And I think it's important to realize that when campaigns are taking place, whether it's a presidential or not, they have to deal with reality. They can't just make it up. 
And so if you take, for example, the current debate between the Republicans going on for the nomination process, which provides me unending entertainment. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's just, just wonderful. I mean, I like having Newt Gingrich in the race. I mean, he's, he's entertaining. Whether you like him or not, he's a very smart guy. He, I mean, you know, he's, you, you can feel the love for himself, um, <laughs> mostly. Uh, but, um, you know, he, he, is a, he, is a really, he is a really smart guy. But when, you know, people have attributed, for example, Romney has these PAC ads that attacked New Gingrich in, uh, in Iowa, and Gingrich says that's the reason he fell. That's, that's a silly argument, because Gingrich was falling across the country, didn't matter what part of it was, and they weren't having attack ads in Montana or California, but his ratings were falling. Why? Because the news media were having a conversation reminding us about some of Gingrich's antics in the past. And that was causing Gingrich some problems. And the bottom line is that Gingrich is a talented person, but there are real constraints with his candidacy. Just like Mitt Romney faces constraints. Um, you know, Mitt Romney, I don't know if you paid any attention to yesterday, where he made the comment, well, he didn't make very much money um, <laughs> uh, giving talks. I mean, $375,000, okay? You know, that's a lot of money. Um, <laughs> And he, and, but it's just for him, it's not that much money. I mean, he could write me a check for $375,000 and he would not feel it. Um, and I would support him, by the way, if he did that. I just want, you know, I'm, I'm out there to be bought. I just want you all to know that, that I'm out there to be bought. Um, but the bottom line is, is, that, is that you can't make it up out of whole cloth. Candidates have their strengths and have their weaknesses. And so that, you know, somebody was asking when this process was starting about Rick Perry, would he be able to win the nomination? I said, no. Why? I said, he's not very smart. And it turns out I really underestimated that one. <laughs> um, but the bottom line is that these things structured. I always thought Gingrich would, would have a run at some point. Why? Because the guy's talented. He has his flaws. He has his quirks. Um, he did take a pledge, by the way, in Iowa that he would stay married during his entire presidential term. <laughs> so the question is, if he decides not to run anymore, does he move on? I don't know. We'll see. Um, but this is, all, this is all fun. But the reason I can make fun of that is it's, it's roughly true. It's like if you're going to make fun of Bill Clinton, you don't make fun of Bill Clinton for not being very smart. Why? Because he's really smart, right? But what do we make fun of? Well, you know, we all know what we can make fun of. And so why? Because it's a fact. It's out there. So the bottom line is, is that these candidates are constrained by real world things. And a lot of times people think, oh, it's all image. Eh, maybe. But the images are based on some set of facts. And so Romney... I think Romney, you know, I've had the chance of meeting Romney a bunch of different times for a variety of different reasons. The guy's flat out smart. The guy is just really a hard worker. He wants to fix problems. I don't think he has an, any strong <laughs> ideological anchor. I think he just wants to get things working. In fact, I really wish in the debate on Monday night, he tried to talk about being a hunter. <laughs> he's not a hunter. <laughs> you know, he's, he's not what he wants to do, right? And he didn't even know the difference between a moose and an elk, okay? I mean, you know, <laughs> all that's a bit of a problem. but. If instead he had just been honest and said, you know, on a Saturday night, or Saturday rather than hunting, I just like to look at spreadsheets. And I just like to figure out, you know, I like to do that. In fact, occasionally like to go out to, to dinner with my wife and then come back home and look more at spreadsheets. <laughs> I mean, that would have been an honest, rough answer, and it would have worked his advantage rather than trying to be one of the guys. He's not one of the guys. I think Rick Perry can be one of the guys, okay? Um, because he does enjoy hunting, and that's part of it, and so he could talk about that. Um, you know, Gingrich was talking about how much he liked sports. He didn't even know the difference between basketball and football. I mean, again, this is not the thing. That, so these people should just be who they are. It always, I think, works for the American public, but Candace can't help it. And a little bit, Gingrich has some of, of Al Gore's disease, in that Gore, you know, when he was running, would just tend to be much more stiff than he actually really is in person. And he tried to be somebody he's not, and it just doesn't work. But again, getting back to the fact that campaigns are just not made up. They're playing to the strengths and weaknesses of candidates, and you shouldn't try to be somebody you're not. And we'll see if you know, Romney can get his act together on that front. He's still a formidable candidate. I mean, he could be president. I don't think there's much doubt about that. I wouldn't bet on it right now, but it's possible. OK, so we've, we've talked about the correlation. That's one reason not to panic. What about popularity? That is, the very first graph I presented to you showed that Barack Obama is not very popular, and therefore one might make the inference that because he's not very popular today, he might not do very well in the presidential election. And that's certainly the news media's inference. Well, being a good political scientist, let's collect a little data. Here is the relationship between the vote and presidential popularity a year out. There is no relationship. The correlation is a whopping 0.01. 
Okay, so the two red graphs, two red people, red, Reagan was not very popular in 83-84, um, but yet he went on to a massive re-election victory. George Bush Sr. was very popular in 91-92 and went on to defeat. There is no relationship between the popularity of the president a year out from the election and the final vote, which again speaks to why the economy, when I saw this graph, then I began to think, wait a second, the economy must not be very stable over the course of a year either. And so I began to then collect these additional data. I was surprised by this. I thought there'd be some correlation. There's none. There is none. So again, the news media are interpreting Barack Obama through this lens, which has no predictive ability for the, for the actual presidential election. OK, what about trial heats? I showed you those trial heats that had Romney slightly ahead of Barack Obama. Do the trial heats a year out from the election approximately, or nine months? Do they tell us anything? Well, here's, a, here's one example. Gary Hart, there's a name for many of you from the past. <laughs> Gary Hart was leading Ronald Reagan in 1983. Not only did Gary Hart not beat Ronald Reagan, he didn't even beat Walter Mondale, OK? Um, and by the way, Walter Mondale, if you ever get a chance to look at the ads of Reagan versus Mondale, and you kind of have distance, unless say some of you are strong, strong Democrats, and you don't really, you know, you have mixed feelings, go back and look at the ads and you'll realize the American public made a very wise choice. <laughs> Walter Mondale, some of his ads, he managed to find ugly children, okay, <laughs> in his ads. It's really hard to find ugly children. I mean, there's a lot of cute kids out there. Cute kids tend to be cute, right? Not Mondale's kids in his ads. They tended to be ugly. Um, Reagan, they're absolutely beautiful kids. You just want to hug them, you know, and Mondale's kids like, whoa, no hug. Um, <laughs> So, and again, that gets back to my point that these ads reflect talents of candidates. Here's a little interesting tidbit about ads. Of all the presidents of recent time, who do you think talked the most in their ads? That is, who actually tried to fill the ads with the most kind of policy stuff? Who was the biggest policy wonk in the last 30 or 40 years? Clinton. And Clinton's ads are just chock full of stuff, much more so than any other presidential candidate. Reagan's weren't chock full. Bush's weren't chock full. Um, but Clinton, like, he just had to get all that stuff in there. It kind of reflects his personality. So again, getting back to this point that stuff isn't made up. Here's another one. George Bush leads Bill Clinton, 58-22. Um, and again, Clinton obviously went on to, to defeat it. So trial heats right now, even though the news media will tout them and say that, that, you know, whether it's Gingrich or Romney or whoever is leading Obama by a little bit, pay no attention to those. These things are very unstable. It's like the popularity measures. So the bottom line is, is that all the indicators that the news media use are pretty suspect. And that maybe Barack Obama has a much uh, better chance to win re-election, or at least we need to think about it differently. So why might Obama win, assuming the economy continues to struggle? Remember that if the economy nosedives further, Obama's going to be out. If, in fact, the economy takes off, he's going to win re-election. But let's assume it just continues to struggle, which is probably a pretty good bet. But still, given those earlier data, I wouldn't want to bet a lot of money on it. My answer, as I kind of suggested at the beginning, is in fact the Tea Party. Well, how the devil could the Tea Party be the cause of Obama's strength rather than his weakness? Well, I want to talk about two kinds of party politicians. I want to talk about purists, and I want to talk about pragmatists. Now, this is a distinction that actually dates back to people like James Q. Wilson, other names that, that you don't need to worry about. So this is not a new distinction uh, in, the, in the field, so to speak. But basically, the purists are the folks who want the ideological commitment, who want purity on those kinds of policy issues. They want to stick to the, their positions. They do not want to compromise. And in fact, we've seen this in a lot of the dealings going on in Congress. The Tea Party movement within, and some of the members here of the Tennessee delegation have dug in their heels and been unwilling to compromise because they believe in, in the purity of their principles. And they would, in some cases, rather lose than moderate in the pursuit of votes. The pragmatists are a very different type of politician. Yeah, they're ideological. Yeah, they may be conservative or liberal, depending on whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. But they want to win elections. And they were more than willing to compromise in the pursuit of that particular particular goal. And so these become important parts of our story. Let me just give you some examples here. Jim DeMint, who is a representative from South Carolina, the senator, and I'll, you can read it yourself, but I'll just read it here. 
I've been in the majority with Republicans who didn't have principles, and we embarrassed ourselves and lost credibility in, in front of the country. Frankly, I'm at a point where I'd rather lose fighting for the right cause than win fighting for the wrong cause. DeMint is a purist. DeMint is willing to lose an election to pursue certain ideological goals. He fits that kind of bill. Karl Rove is, in fact, a pragmatist. This, this actual exchange came from 2010. How many, how many people actually remember the name Christine O'Donnell? A few people. Oh, it, and if those of you who don't, you just need to go on, you know, go on the internet, check on YouTube, and look under O'Donnell and Witch. Okay. <laughs> um, now you might think, whoa, 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 now you may remember who she was, for those of you who didn't remember the name. She ran for, this, for, for Senate in Delaware, and it turns out that when she was like a teenager, she dabbled in witchcraft. Uh, I don't know what that exactly means, but she was obviously a little bit of a loose cannon, and this came out, and she actually, her media consultant, a guy named Fred Davis, who's probably one of the smartest media consultants in the business right now, Fred has her do an ad that starts out looking straight into the camera, I'm not a witch. That's how the ad starts, and it's just wonderful. Um, and this is a woman who gave away the Senate seat in Delaware to the Democrats because she was not going to be able to win Delaware, but she got the nomination, defeated a very moderate Republican for the nomination, and then that cost it. And in fact, the Tea Party, and you'll begin to see where my argument's going, the Tea Party actually cost the Republicans control of the U.S. Senate, probably, though they energized the party in a lot of ways. Colorado, um, to some degree Alaska, uh, Delaware, and there's one other state I'm blanking on right now where they could have ended up doing better. But Here's Karl Rove basically saying, whoa, wait a second. I, you know, I'm going to support the Republican, but if, if Christine O'Donnell had not been the nominee, you know, we'd have a chance at the seat. So he's making the comment, I'm for the Republican, but we're looking at eight to nine seats in the Senate. We were looking. Now we're looking at seven to eight, in my opinion. Rove is irritated because Rove is a pragmatist. Rove wants ideology, yes, but Rove wants to win elections because, you know, to win elections is the way you get power. And so there is this kind of disagreement and battle that goes on. Well, how does this play out um, in the presidential contest, and how does this matter for Obama? Okay, there are pragmatists and there are purists, and this battle goes on in all parties, whether you're Democrats or Republicans. But following a presidential defeat, so the Republicans lost the presidency in 2008, or for example, following maybe defeat by the Democrats, let's say 1980, doesn't matter what, the losing party has basically a battle, a pretty harsh battle between the pragmatists and the purists. The purists say, you know, we didn't win in 2008 because we weren't pure enough to our principles. We didn't stick to our ideological guns. We were not conservative enough. In fact, you hear that argument today, why the Republicans really need to nominate someone like a Santorum or Gingrich more so than Romney because that person's much more conservative and therefore is much more likely to win. That is a purist argument. Okay. The pragmatist argument is, well, well, wait a second, we lost the 2008 election. We may need to even moderate more because someone like Obama managed to beat us. So there's a very different view of the outcome of the election. But early on, because of the defeat, because you lost trying to be a moderate such as a John McCain, the purists have the upper hand in the initial battles. Because the purists are energized, they're angry, they're upset, and they themselves see the current president, in this case Obama, they see the current president far away from them, far away from them, and a big threat. I mean, the dislike of Obama among the kind of purest Republicans is really quite staggering. In fact, there's a, a new data set that I was, I've just collected um, through a service called YouGov where I'm trying to figure out my question. It's a different question, but trying to figure out bias against Mormons. I'm fascinated by this question about why people would not be willing to vote for Mitt Romney because he's, because he's Mormon. I just I find it an interesting question. So I have an oversample of Southern evangelicals, and I just want to figure out what makes them tick. Now, we have a scale in political science. It's called a feeling thermometer that runs from 0 to 100. 0 is, you know, totally frigid and cold. 100 is you love the person. 50 is you're kind of lukewarm. And we've been using this scale since 1964. It's well tested. It's well understood. You know, Barack Obama's feeling thermometers correlate pretty highly with approval. He's, you know, he's about his... his his uh, feeling thermometers tend to be about 40, 50 percent. So what would your guess be for Southern evangelicals who were over 60 years old? What do you think their feeling thermometer would be towards Obama? Of course, this is a group that doesn't like Obama very much. 
Now, let me give you a tidbit here. This group, Southern Evangelicals, their rating of atheists, okay, a group they're not very fond of, okay, is 19 degrees. They give atheists 19 degrees. What do you think they give Barack Obama? Six. Someone said five, very good guess. Six. 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 I mean, like, I, I, you know, that means like nobody's giving him over 20, and there's a bunch of people giving him zero. This is a lot of dislike out there. This is purest sentiment. And this purest sentiment is very strong. Now, there's a lot of different potential components to it. But part of it is that these people believe Barack Obama is just way out there. In fact, of that same group, 89% believe that Barack Obama is very liberal. Okay, now, if you ask the very liberals, 2% of very liberals think Barack Obama is very liberal, okay? It's really, you know, wherever you sit really shapes how you look at the world, okay? But that's like a staggering difference. I've never seen anything like that. When people ask that about George Bush, yeah, liberals thought George Bush was very conservative. But conservatives thought George Bush was conservative. Liberals don't think Barack Obama's liberal. But the other side of the coin, they think he's just like off-scale socialist liberal and all that kind of stuff. Which is, you know, some of the rhetoric of Rick Perry, for example, you know, just says explicitly, Barack Obama's a socialist. Um, I just want to have him take my intro to American politics class and, you know, kind of just I throw a couple of definitions out there. Um, but nonetheless, you have this battle between purists and pragmatists. And this battle is going on in all parties. But after a defeat, the purists get the upper hand. The purists have the better argument. They've got the motivation. They've got often the money. And they basically move parties to their ideological extreme in the short term. So the Republican purists move the Republican Party to the right. If the Democrats are the ones who lose the party, lose the election, they move them to the left. And this has consequences. And these are the consequences I'm talking about, that basically Barack Obama has the benefit in all likelihood of competing against a candidate who's going to be a little bit more ideologically extreme than was in 2008, and therefore have a harder time getting the commitment and the support of moderate Americans. There are some moderate Americans out there, OK? <laughs> Um, not a huge number anymore, but there are some, and they're the ones that tilt the election. The country is polarized in a lot of ways, and I think Mark uh, talked about that last week, if my memory serves based on what Mark told me. Um, no, doubt about, no doubt about that, but this is playing to this particular dynamic. And here's a little piece of data that shows this general argument, the implications. Here's the party vote in presidential elections from 1912 to, 19, to 2008. This is the share of the vote that the party who lost the previous election, the share of the vote they get in the immediate election afterwards, they get 41%. In other words, they're losing pretty badly. The share of the vote in the second contest, because by the time the second contest goes on, the basic argument is the purists get a hold of the party, move it to the left or move it to the right. That damages the party in the next presidential election, allowing the president to be reelected. And then the purists lose control of the party because the pragmatists say, wait a second, we followed your tactic and we lost. And so now the pragmatists get the thing and they move the party back more towards the center and that's reflective in these kinds of data. Obviously, lots of other things are unfolding, but this kind of difference underscores it. Um, now, here's a picture of a classic example. Does anybody know who this happens to be? I was giving this lecture, a version of this lecture at Swarthmore College this fall. And Swarthmore is filled with you know, some of the best and the brightest, just like Vanderbilt is here. And so I put this picture up, and I said, anybody who knows who that is, I will get you a Vanderbilt t-shirt and send it to you. <laughs> Knowing full well, or let me rephrase that, assuming full well, that nobody would possibly know who this is. And a young lady, 18, 19 years old, immediately knew it. And this is Alf Landon. And my assumption was, OK, you from Kansas? No, I'm from Massachusetts. And I said, well, how do you know that? Well, I, you know, I, I, she's a nerd, okay? I loved her. I mean, I, you know, she got a Vanderbilt t-shirt, everything's set, but this is Alf Landon. I didn't know who Alf Landon was, and I've studied these things. Um, but Alf Landon's a classic example of this. Alf Landon got really badly damaged in the 36 campaign. Um, there was a very famous statement, as Maine goes, so goes the country. Then after his victory in Maine, in September of 1936, it became as Maine goes, so goes Vermont, because they only won two states in that particular contest. 
Um, and he played to an ideologically purist argument about how the New Deal had gone too far. And then from then on, the Republicans started to run the Me Too campaigns, where they moderated and accepted the New Deal, and they started to do better. And eventually, I mean, once they managed to get past Roosevelt, so to speak, they did, in fact, start to do well, as represented by Eisenhower, who's a classic pragmatist, um, a classic kind of pragmatist. Um, here's another picture. Oops, wrong thing. Barry Goldwater. <laughs> I, I have to say that I don't even think Barry Goldwater could get the nomination today in the Republican Party. Okay, Barry Goldwater was really much more of a libertarian than anything else. But he made a purist argument follow, following the defeat in 1960 of the Republicans. He made a purist type of argument. Now, Goldwater would have, did claim, uh, I taught at Arizona State for 10 years, so I had the benefit of, of having him come to my class three or four different times. Unbelievably smart guy, really classic gentleman in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, he, he lost badly in that election. He made a purist kind of argument. He really believed that being conservative and getting the core out was going to be enough to carry the election. And he won five states. And he lost very badly to, to Lyndon Johnson for, for a lot of reasons. But he's a classic purist. And not to pick on just Republicans, here's another purist on the Democratic side, McGovern. McGovern, the Democrats had lost the election in 1968, the presidency. There was a big battle between the uh, kind of purists and the pragmatists from the Democratic Party. And McGovern came out with the nomination and went on to massive defeat um, in, in 1972. I remember as a kid, I was probably 14. My dad was a pretty big Democrat and had uh, worked for Lyndon Johnson in campaigns. And I don't think he was very involved in McGovern's campaign. But I have clear memory of the election night. I was going to watch the results. I was into this stuff even as a teenager. And uh, I can remember trying to get my dad to pay attention to the results because oh, it's going to be terrible. Don't, don't watch. It's going to be ugly. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. You know, I was being the optimist. Um, and then the first election results came in, and McGovern had won the state of Massachusetts. <laughs> and like, Dad, he's won the first state. I mean, it's, it's, of course, that was the only state he won the entire <laughs> night. Um, he did, I think he did carry DC. But um, it was a very long night for a teenager who was had his first lesson in, in reality, I suppose. But again, this is playing to this, this case. So there's this tension that goes on between the parties. And that right now, we see this in the Republican case. And you can see that some of the rhetoric of the Republicans are, in fact, pushing the party out to the right. And this is the, the argument. So when you go to what's going on now, of course, Mitt, in some sense, represents the pragmatists. Um, he's more moderate than, in fact, someone like Newt. Um, and you know who, who, in fact, is going to get the, get the nomination? What, there's a couple of possibilities that unfold here. First of all, maybe Romney gets the nomination. And he's viewed as more moderate. And so, it's a, so it kind of goes against having a purist as, as the nominee and therefore going down to defeat. And I suspect Romney can do pretty well in the election. Whether he wins or not depends to some degree on the economy and the kind of campaign he runs and making sure that he can resonate with the American public. There are times, I don't know how many, where you pay attention to Romney and he really is good. And then there's other times when he's just dreadful. And if he can get his, get his skills up, he's a lot better than he was in 08. And so if he can continue to improve, in fact, in some sense, he wants to win South Carolina so he can win the nomination. But he might be better off having a more protracted battle and getting his skills honed. Um, he might actually be benefit. Because I tell you, Barack Obama's gift, again, was Hillary Clinton. Because he, he faced such a tough competitor and got his skills really sharpened that he was much more effective in the general election. So there's, a, there's a, a battle that's going on here. But the real question becomes, if someone, whether, you know, someone like Romney, is what happens to the base? Does the base stay home? Um, I don't think the base probably stays home. I think there's enough antipathy towards Obama. But the real question is, what happens to moderate Americans? Does Romney have to move enough to the right to get the nomination to, to cause him real problems? And when he tries to pivot back, you can believe Barack Obama and the super PACs and the, you know, basically $1 billion of advertising money, it probably won't be that much, probably be more like six, seven hundred million advertising dollars, will be there to push Romney back and make Romney look pretty extreme. I mean, it's going to be an amazing battle that's unfolding, partly because of the huge amounts of money, but also because of the huge stakes. Um, but I do think that the structural part of American politics, this battle between purists and pragmatists, plays itself out all the time. Look at what the purists and pragmatists are doing on the Democratic side. The liberal wing of the party is not very happy with Barack Obama. But they're not 
fight. There's no candidate. They're not putting up a fight. But I guarantee you that if Barack Obama loses in the 2012 election, the purists will reassert themselves, and it'll be very interesting to see the kind of nominee that the Democrats would put forward. And it might be the kind of nominee that ensures a Republican victory in 2016. So there's this interplay. And it takes parties a little while to learn the lesson that the American public, despite the polarization, is in fact reasonably pragmatic collectively. And therefore, they respond a little bit better to, to kind of moderate candidates. So I've certainly, I don't even know what time it is. I have no idea. <laughs> what time? 10 16. And we are going to what time? 10.45, we have a half hour for questions. I can't imagine any of you have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, um, I like what you said about purists and parties and all that, and advertising is important. But with the internet and with a more educated public, how important is uh, the intelligence of the candidate? And I know in, when Obama was running, several of my friends that are very, very smart said, well, I don't know for sure, but the experts tell me this person knows. So how much, how important is expertise, the actual intelligence of the candidate, and what people are saying on the internet? Okay. Uh, people get the, do people hear that over here? Okay, good. That's what I figured I'd do. Okay. And, and if I misrepresent, um, number one is the impact of the internet in this campaign. And the second is just the general intelligence of the candidate. How much does that does that matter? Um, well, first of all, one of the things that I, I uh, let me take the in reverse order. For anybody who gets the nomination of a major party for president, whether it be Bob Dole, whether it be Al Gore, whether it be Barack Obama, John McCain, these are very talented candidates. And so the process of vetting is a very tough one. And we've seen the process of vetting. I mean, look at, you know, there was a period of time when Herman Cain was being taken seriously. And then it turns out he doesn't know where Libya is, right? And so that, that poses a problem for him, and then basically he starts to fall. You know, Rick Perry was viewed as a serious candidate until he couldn't name the agencies that he wanted to get rid of, and that was a proxy for various kinds of concerns people had. So the vetting process, when you get to the nomination, the nominees, you're talking about pretty good candidates. And there's a story about um, during the 2000 campaign, Gore came in on a bunch of his advisors who were around the table basically making fun of George Bush, saying George Bush wasn't very smart. And Gore blew up at them and said, look, you guys are out of your mind. If you think we're running a campaign based on the fact that George Bush isn't smart enough to be president, we will lose. George Bush is plenty smart. He may not, in fact, have read as many books as we might like, but the bottom line is this guy's plenty smart. So I don't think that is going to play very much. It's much more of a question of the nomination process, and you can see that certain people just don't have the skills. So I think, for example, someone like Sarah Palin, Sarah Palin has skills that you can't teach. She just has a knack for things, but she's a little lazy. She's not willing to know the policy issues and work hard enough. And so my view about her was she's a serious presidential candidate if she's willing to work hard enough to be the study. So someone like Romney is willing to put in the extra time. And the system kind of sorts these people out along that line. So I wouldn't worry too much about about that one, that usually these nominees, if it's Mitt Romney or Gingrich or whatever, and we know that, you know, in 2008, I mean, Obama and Hillary Clinton, I mean, talk about two talented people. I mean, that was, that was really, without a doubt, the case. So then the second question is about the internet. We don't know a lot about the internet yet. What I think the bigger change that's going on that speaks maybe broadly to your issue is that, think about in the 1960s, the kind of media environment you guys had, and I had, versus what occurs now. Basically, you might sit down during the evening, during the evening, you might have dinner, and you might watch the evening news, and you had a choice of a couple of channels. You might watch Brinkley, you might watch um, Cronkite or whatever, but you didn't have a huge amount of choice. And that basically, if you were going to watch TV, you, and you, didn't have a, you couldn't watch you know, reruns of Seinfeld or watch the cooking channel, which my daughter likes for reasons that escape me since she never cooks. But um, <laughs> that's, that's a different issue. Um, you have, you, you have that, that environment, which was basically you kind of were sitting in a chair, and it was kind of forced choice. You didn't have a lot of choice. And in fact, like advertising, you would be watching TV, and the ads would come across at that point in time. Today's environment is completely different. We are filled with choices. 
on the evening, you know, when you sit down for dinner, yeah, you could watch the evening news, you could watch cable news, you could watch the cooking channel, you can watch reruns, you could watch Netflix. You can do hundreds of different things. And there has been this huge sea change because you now have choice. You yourself have control over your media environment. 50 years ago or even 30 or 40 years ago, you didn't have nearly as much control. Heck, you can use DVD, DVRs to sort out <coughs> stuff and maybe even avoid the, the commercials altogether. So I think that's a huge difference. And one of the implications is that it's created, we, you know, Mark talked about polarization last week. There's another kind of polarization that's unfolded, in, information polarization. All of you are pretty interested in politics, so you guys can absorb a lot more information. But somebody who doesn't want to listen to politics, they can check out completely. But back in the 60s, when they wanted to watch TV, they, got, they were subjected to Cronkite. And so we actually have some data now that suggests that the uninformed were actually a little bit more relatively informed, even though collectively overall we're better informed that there's a different distribution because of what you're talking about the internet, I'm expanding a little bit, we just have an ear of choice. So I think that's a really important part of the story. Yes, sir. Yeah. The, the 48 election um, is, a, is a fascinating election for a lot of different reasons. Uh, it was a surprise for a lot of people because the anticipation was that Dewey was going to win the election and, and Truman was going to be sent back to Missouri. And there's all this very famous picture a lot of you have probably seen of, Dewey, of uh, Truman holding the Chicago Tribune headline that says Dewey wins. He surprised everybody. That election, for the reasons you just suggested, has in fact caught the attention of political scientists and people have studied that campaign quite a bit. There's two reasons that are positive for, what's, for what happened. And that's probably a combination of, of them. The first one is that the polling that led people to believe that Dewey would win stopped two weeks before the election. And there was no polling between the last two weeks. And so therefore, some people have posited, with some modest amount of evidence for it, that there was a shift to Truman at the end that was not picked up by the polls. That's one thing. But the actual, the more, expl the more likely explanation is that the polls, or the bigger explanation, is the polls themselves were flawed that in 1948, Gallup and a few other polls were relying on something called quota sampling. And the quota sampling basically said that you want to make sure you have the right number of, of let's say, poor or well-off or women or men. And what they were doing was, rather than going into, let's say, areas where there were more poor people, they tended to be doing their quota sampling among wealthier people. And so the sample was biased to the Republicans. And that Dewey was never really ahead. It was just a problem with the polling. So following 48, there was a big debate about how polls had screwed up. And interestingly, in 36, where the Gallup poll had called the election correctly, they actually they called it correctly, but they were way off by the final vote that, that, uh, that Roosevelt had because their sampling was underestimating the Democratic vote because they were not sampling enough of, of less well-off people. And, that, and even in the 40s and the 30s, there was this kind of social divide where the Republicans were drawing from well-off. So, I think it's more of a story about polling and, the, and mostly the sampling design. And they changed that sampling design uh, following the 48 debacle. And they really have, they basically gotten it right. And even today with polls and all the problems with cell phones and other stuff like that, they're still getting it pretty, pretty accurate. Um, yes, sir. Um, the question is, uh, if I, I get it right, is that basically the, the, the power of the news media may be greater today because they're covering it differently than they covered it in the past. Um, you know, that's, a, that's a, a good hypothesis in the sense that the 24-hour news cycle has changed things where, you know, now we can get news constantly where before it might be the evening news or you'd get your morning newspaper. Um, at this point in time, the early looks suggest that's not the case, that really the news media respond to events, the news media don't drive events, is the general view. Um, but I say that with some hesitation. I, I wouldn't, I think it probably is going to matter a little bit. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to sort out. And also, even when I use the term the media, that's misleading because it used to be a fair assumption in the 70s and the 80s when there was the three major networks and you had a handful of leading newspapers. But now it's very much more of a kind of a bottom-up process where you've got not only the disintegration of the news media so you can watch MSNBC or you can watch Fox News, 
but you know, newspapers themselves have, have declined. People are doing a lot of online uh, kinds of stuff. And you can basically create, as to the earlier question, you can create your own news media environment. And if you're a conservative, you tend to create a conservative environment. If you're a liberal, you tend to create a liberal environment. So I spend all my time, because I'm, I'm what I call a raging moderate. I don't know if there's such a thing, but I, I like to think it was possible. Um, <coughs> that you know, I watch Fox. And I watch MSNBC as long as I can stand both of them, and then I change to, and then I go to Anderson Cooper and his blue eyes, and I change to that because I, I just don't get the, I do not understand the popularity of Anderson Cooper. But, um, but nonetheless, I think it's a fair hypothesis. I don't have a good answer for it, but there's, te but don't, as a general rule, don't oversell the the media. Yes. You did not touch on the issue of the disarray in the Republican. Party and how that will affect the election. Well, the, or the, will it? Well, the, the question is about the disarray in the Republican Party and how that might affect the election. In some sense, I did talk about it in that the purist and the pragmatist, the argument that goes on is in fact reflective of that disarray. That is, there's disagreement about whether to be whether to go to the hard to the right or go to the middle. And, and right now, you've got people like Santorum and Gingrich claiming that we have to be more conservative. Romney implicitly is talking about being, trying to be more moderate. But this is what goes on after you lose a presidential election. The, the party has a, a discussion, and it leads to a lot of disagreement. And so I'm not sure I'd call it disarray. Um, you know, if you listen to the news media's coverage of these of the of previous elections, et cetera, there's always that kind of term. Again, I think the Republicans have a pretty good shot at this election if they nominate the right kind of candidate. Um, I'm not so sure that they're in that much disarray. The dislike of Obama is so strong that even if these people are unhappy with, with Romney, like the Southern Evangelicals, <coughs> they'll end up turning out for him. And even if they don't, the Southern Evangelicals are concentrated in the Southern states. And you know, North Carolina and Virginia are in play. But you know, Mississippi's not going to Barack Obama, right? I mean, if it does, then Barack Obama wins every other state. And you know, I don't think he's carrying Utah either. So I'm not so sure that the, I would be hesitant. There is a disagreement in the Republican Party. That disagreement's natural. And that's leading to your description of disarray. But I'm not so sure. They haven't yet sorted it out. And that's what they're having the nomination process for. So I would be a little bit more optimistic about that. Yes, ma'am. The question is, what role does the wife, the wife or the candidate play? Um, usually none. Um, we, we, people have tried to test this. Uh, it's very difficult to sort out. Usually, first, first wives, for example, tend to be more popular than their, than their husbands. Not always. I mean, Hillary Clinton was somewhat of a, an exception. But um, though I'm not actually, she may have been more popular at certain points in time. Certainly after Monica Lewinsky, she was. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's hard to measure. So, for example, to I saw Ann Romney introduce Mitt Romney after he won the New Hampshire primary. I don't know if she was using a teleprompter or not. I was trying to look for it, and I didn't see it. If she was not using a teleprompter, this is a very impressive person who was really skilled and, and, and you know, measured in her presentation and I think happen, you know, humanizes Romney a little bit and would be a real asset. So I think that they make a difference. It's hard to, hard to sort out. Um, in the end, if you have a choice between having a popular candidate and a popular spouse, always choose the popular uh, candidate, I think. But these two things are, you know, tend to be, you know, as you know, you know, couples tend to take on similar characteristics. They start to think like and, and all that type of stuff. So it's hard to sort out, but it, uh, the data we have suggests not a huge amount of difference. Yes, sir. Okay, the question is about the VP um, choices. Well, first of all, uh, who Romney might choose? I mean, one common per cho mentioned person is Rubio, who is senator from Florida, who would help him in a lot of different quarters, especially among Tea Party people. That makes some sense. Um, what I'm interested in, does Romney decide to double down on the business model? That is basically, you need business to run the government, et cetera. And so if he really wants to double down on that and he wants to throw a wild card in, you know, would he choose someone like a Meg Whitman, who, who is, you know, 
didn't do very well in California, but no Republican does very well in California, so I'm not sure how much that does um, hurt. It'll be interesting to see. One of the things I'm always struck by, and this was true for Clinton, it's true for, for George Bush, et cetera, is that when these people become the nominee, and this gets back to kind of an earlier point, you know, they realize that, wait a second, they can be president of the United States, and this is a pretty serious thing. And there was a discussion that happened between Clinton and his advisors about who to choose for VP. And his advisors all favored Gephardt, because Gephardt was from Missouri. It would get Missouri into the Clinton camp, and it would increase the chances of winning. They also all agreed that Gore, who was the other possible candidate, wouldn't help him electorally as much is the judgment, but they thought he'd work better with Clinton and he would be a better potential president than Gephardt. So they had these two, but, this, but the staff was pushing, pushing Gephardt. And Clinton was saying, wait a second, you know, I really like Gore. And they keep saying, well, but we can win the election. And then Clinton just stops the conversation, but, and he's talking to Paul Begala, who's a CNN correspondent, and he says, Pauly, the problem is I could die. We're going with Gore. That tells you the seriousness of it. If you think about George Bush's choice of, of Cheney, you know, Cheney was chosen not for electoral reasons. What he needed, Wyoming? I mean, you know, Wyoming was going to be in the Republican camp, right? He chose uh, uh, Cheney because of his credentials, because he understood foreign policy. So I think in the end, these things become a very personal judgment about who's going to be able to serve, and they begin to realize the weight of the office. So there is a strategic aspect to it, but I also think that in the end they want to choose someone who will work well with them. And that's one thing that Gore and Clinton had, is when they were on a stage together, it felt right, it worked well for them. And partly because they genuinely liked each other. And there's been tensions in those two camps over the years, but at that time in 1992. So I think it's hard to anticipate, I mean, who would be chosen. I'm going to choose someone over here. Yes, sir? You haven't mentioned Iraq. Afghanistan or even Iran, mm -hmm. are they non-influential as far yeah. as all of this is concerned? Well, the, the question is about foreign policy broadly. You've got Iraq, Iran, um, Afghanistan. I think given the state of the economy, uh, they pale somewhat in comparison. The Republicans aren't going to want to really talk much about it, partly because you know, of Osama bin Laden's death under, on, during Obama's presidency you know, basically neutralizes that issue. <clears throat> um, I think that, I don't think the Republicans disagree a huge amount with Obama on foreign policy. And we saw a similar kind of dynamic once the Cold War ended and the Berlin Wall, so to speak, fell. Foreign policy as a, as a key issue fell out of favor. In 1992, between Clinton and Bush, it was rarely talked about, yet Bush had orchestrated a very successful Gulf War. And he brought the end to you know, during, at least during his term, brought the end to, uh, of the Soviet Union. So we're right now in an era, because of the state of the economy, because there's not a huge amount of differences, I think you won't see it talked about a huge amount. But some event could put it on the, on the map easily. And these are not minor issues. I mean, Iran is a serious one. And, and to Rick Santorum's credit, he talks a lot about it and makes it a pretty big issue. And I think certainly the Obama people know. But I would be surprised, given the state of the economy, it to play up very much. Yes, sir? Um, the question is about the voter ID law and how it may affect the uh, elections. I don't, I don't have enough data to be able to, to speak to that. I mean, we know American history is filled with examples of trying to, you know, make the process better by constraining re voting. I mean, it, the original reasons why we had registration, which came in the 1890s, was because we wanted to keep immigrants from voting. And so that there, this is a long history of American politics, and I think that these things are inevitable. Um, they're not necessarily good. And a lot of times, the predicted effects of these things are not exactly as anticipated. So for example, a few years ago, maybe about 18 or so, they developed some, we've all benefited from it in some sense, motor voter laws, where you'd be able to register when you get your driver's license and made it easier. The Republicans were convinced this was a huge benefit to the Democrats and it was really going to hurt the Republicans. Turned out that was just wrong. It helped the Republicans because the folks who were doing the motor voter tended to be kind of middle class folks who were an upper middle class who were going to vote Republican. So it's hard to know exactly these, these kinds of effects. We also have to let the legal process take place. I would not be surprised if some of these laws and more restrictive laws get, get tossed out. Um, 
but it's it, it you know it's like redistricting it's the same kind of thing i mean we've just had redistricting here in the state and the republicans control it they get to set the rules just like the democrats did for for a while so it's it's somewhat inevitable yeah what about third party ah that's actually a really good question something that i've dodged because i can't stand my i love two parties it makes my life easier three really makes it hard <laughs> So it's like messing with my dependent variable. I get very upset about that. Um, there is a movement called Americans Elect. Actually, they were on campus here at the end of November to make a presentation. This is a pretty formidable group that could, in fact, shape the election. What they're doing is it's, um, it, it's spearheaded by a small group of people, and they are putting the money in to get a, somebody on the ballot in all 50 states, which is not an easy thing to do because there's a lot of restrictions, getting back to kind of an earlier theme, the states get together. The two parties don't agree on a lot, but they can agree on keeping third parties out. And that they kind of have that, that's common ground to use an overused phrase. Uh, and so they're gonna get on all 50 ballots and they're gonna put forward a nominee. I don't know who that nominee will be. Uh, clearly they are hoping for someone like a Michael Bloomberg, mayor of New York, or someone like a Mitch Daniels. Um, when um, when the, the Ackermans are, uh, Peter Ackerman, who is a, a major contributor uh, to it, he, he clearly wants a kind of an Eisenhower-type Republican, a moderate Republican, to be able to win. He's not happy with the right wing of the Republican Party, and he's certainly not happy with Obama. And so he's hoping that this middle can, can do well. The data that I've seen so far suggests that, again, it's the uh, Americans elect as another group that's a gift for Obama. Because Obama has his core of about 40% that's not going to move. And then the question is, can he get that other 10% among kind of the undecideds? And if you break up the, the opposition to Obama among American elect group, whoever that might be, kind of like a Mitch Daniels and whoever the Republican nominee is, it helps Obama's, Obama's cause. But I think the success of this movement, um, they're tying into technology and other stuff, at this point in time, they're getting a lot of ink, and I think they could be a serious player, speaks to the unhappiness of the country has with the, with the way the country's running. Look at the po popularity of Congress. I mean, you know, 16%. I mean, its unpopularity is 84%. I mean, that's, and it's deserved. I mean, you know, these, these, there's, there's a bunch of rogues in there, yeah. Yeah. Ron Paul is, uh, the question is about Ron Paul and that he'll stay in the race a long time and what impact he might have. You know, Paul is an interesting character. You've got to give him credit. I mean, he just says what he thinks. And at one level, that's refreshing. At another level, it's absolutely terrifying, um, in, my op in my moderate opinion. Um, he'll stay in because he's got a core of support. His, he's not, his campaign's not based on winning. He's, he's kind of like a... I think about these candidates, before the process started, Paul's making a, uh, uh, basically an ideological statement. People like Romney and Gingrich, these people wanted to win. I viewed, I viewed Herman Cain's candidacy as he wanted a talk show, and that's what his goal was. And I thought actually Santorum wanted higher speaker's fees <laughs> so that he could charge more money to universities and others, and that's really what they were about. It was about income, um, and that they really didn't think they'd win. Now, I underestimated Santorum or maybe just didn't think through that every other candidate would fall, you know, fall flat. Um, but I think that Paul wants to make a certain statement. I'm not so sure that the Republican Party is going to buy into, into very much of it. But you also want to find a way to keep him happy to get his support. Um, so far, based on the primary vote, you know, in New Hampshire, New Hampshire allows independents to vote. Forty-four percent of the electorate, that is the voting Republicans, were in fact self-identified independents. Only 56% were, were rep self-identified Republicans. That partly reflects the fact that independents can vote, and so therefore the Democratic side was boring because Obama was going to win, so they went over to the Republicans. But it also is a testimony to his, his uh, power. And so one of the things you wouldn't want if you're a Republican is for him to get the nomination of Americans elect um, and then take off, peel off a certain chunk of kind of some people who would never turn out, but other people who are pretty reliable Republicans. And he's a serious force, and it speaks to the un he is again another candidate whose success speaks to the unhappiness that the country has with the direction of the country. And nobody should underestimate his power and the, the dogged determination of his 
support us, they turn out in, in high rates. And uh, that's what politics is all about. It makes it interesting. But, you know, he's not, I don't think he'll move the Republican Party much. But, but if, I'm not, if I'm Romney, I want to keep him happy somehow. Yes, sir. Oh, the question is, how much would you mention the success of bin Laden? Um, you know, I probably wouldn't, I don't think I'd make it a centerpiece. I'd, if I, the key thing for, the, for Obama to figure out is to develop a narrative that's compelling about the economy. And I think that's the single, the single biggest challenge that he faces. Um, I think that he also needs to find a way, which I'm stunned by his bad judgment in regards to health care. That once that bill was passed, he should have gone on the campaign trail of the effect and tell the American public what it's about. I mean, I myself, you know, and I'm reasonably informed, I still don't fully understand the details uh, of it all. He should have been much more willing to tell the American public what it was about, and I think he would have gained more points for it. He's got a serious campaign to run, but remember, all this concern about Obama, he hasn't really ginned up his campaign yet. And he's going to start putting out a lot of ads, putting out a lot of messages, and I think he'll remind people about a lot of good things that he's, that he's accomplished. And certainly the, the bin Laden thing is going to be to his credit and at least neutralizes the terrorism issue as a, previously it was a big advantage for the Republicans that that is no longer the case. So, I mean, I think, I, I think that's a fair question. I don't have a, a good handle. If he turns to it a lot, that tells me he doesn't have a good argument on the economy, and I think he's in trouble would be my... Yes, sir, in the back. Why do you think there's so much anger against Obama as an objective, open-minded Methodist? I think he has great qualities, and I wonder whether the Republicans are envious of those qualities. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, the, the question is why people don't like Barack better, that he's got a lot of good qualities. Well, I think it partly speaks to the, to the polarization of the country. That is his... Uh, you said open-minded Methodist, is that correct? Open -minded. Okay, open-minded Methodist. Um, that's, I love to hear that. Um, you know, that's one, you know, you, you have a certain position and you're looking at that from that, but there's a lot of people who have differing, you know, differing kinds of views and it's a matter of where you come from. I mean, going back to that earlier piece of data, I'm stunned by the fact that, that Southern Evangelicals, 89% rate Obama as very liberal and 1% of, of this group thinks of him as moderate. Nobody thinks of him as conservative. I mean, it's just overwhelming the consensus about that. I think it reflects a number of different things. One of the things I believe it reflects is, in fact, getting back to the earlier question about the news media, that because we have this liberal and conservative news media, that people who are conservative are only listening to conservative news and they get their positions reinforced. And that's a serious problem. Um, it gets people energized, and that's a good thing. And we actually have higher turnout than we've had for a while. And I think all that's a good thing. But I also don't think you get, you know, get con information that conflicts with your ideological position enough. And I think that's a real, a real potential structural uh, problem that we face. Yes, sir. Why did Huntsman not catch fire or not even smolder? <laughs> well, he was smoldered. But um, <laughs> why did Huntsman not catch fire? You know, when he did, I don't know if you remember his very first event where he was doing it in New York City. It was the same backdrop as Ronald Reagan did to start his campaign. And he didn't have the microphones working. They didn't have anything working quite right. And it was kind of a disaster. I don't think he was ready to run. You know, there's a, there's a tendency in American politics for somebody to think, and it was true for Wesley Clark, that I think I'm just going to run for president. Okay, I think I'll run for, it's not an easy job. And you need to be re ready and tested and think about it for a long period of time. And oh, Romney wasn't ready in 08, and that reflected the fact that he struggled. And he's now much more ready. Um, and I just don't think Huntsman was, was ready. I mean, I actually thought uh, Tom Ingram, who is a local Tennessean tied to, um, to uh, Corker and to uh, Lamar Alexander, very smart guy. Uh, I respect him a lot. You know, he went to work for Huntsman. And when he was, went to work for Huntsman, I thought, wow, I said, this guy knows what he's doing. That's maybe help Huntsman. But he just didn't, he just didn't get, get it. And he was facing Romney, who was just better, you know, more battle-tested and ready for it. I mean, some of his debate performances were surprisingly hollow. Um, again, you've just got to become a real student of politics. I mean, if you, you know, you may not like Newt Gingrich, but he knows a lot of stuff. Not quite as much as he thinks he does, but he knows a lot of stuff. <laughs> And that really does help. So I think Huntsman, but he might come back in 16. I mean, it's a serious, a serious talent, but 
it's just hard to, it's a hard job. And, you know, you really have to be vetted in a serious way. And he just never caught on. And also the decision to focus on, on uh, New Hampshire, that's always a risky, a risky thing to do. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about prediction of election outcomes. And, for example, I think you showed the approval rating not being a very good predictor. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you looked at uh, uh, Bush. And he was an outlier because apparently he, he had a good approval rating, but as you know, he didn't get elected. Right. Uh, if you adjust for uh, the economy, does a factor fall out that would say that approval rating is important? Well, it tur I think I let me ask the question is about the relationship between approval rating and the economy. Yeah. Um, the two things do go hand in hand. That is, right now, Obama's approval rating isn't very good because the economy isn't very good. But it turns out that, that if the election were held today, Barack Obama would be in deep trouble. But it's not being held today. And it turns out that six months down the road, things could change a lot. And you, we've seen over the course of history big shifts in, in approval. I mean, you think about something like 9-11 and how that just shot Bush's approval through the, through the roof because of the horrible events of that particular day. And then, you know, it would move up and down. And, you know, you saw Obama get a boost in popularity right following the killing of Osama bin Laden. So there's a lot of things that could go on. And, you know, a, a six months in politics is, in fact, to use an uh, overused phrase, a lifetime in politics. So they do matter. It just matters. We know our elections are at a fixed time. And there's also a certain element of luck to when they happen to be scheduled. So does Barack Obama get lucky and the economy really starts cooking just before the election? Or do you get unlucky like George Bush did, Bush won, where the economy started cooking right after the election was cast and, in fact, was doing pretty well, but Bush got no credit. We're out of time, okay, <laughs> sorry.